Welcome to another episode of 15 Minute Friday. My name is Jeff Atkinson, and I am not presenting this month. I have the uh, special honor of introducing our uh, our guest, I guess, presenter this month is our new um, new member of our agronomy team, Dr. Aaron Paul Matier. Uh, Dr. Paul Matier has a has a long history in the ornamental production industry. is very respected within the ornamental production industry and thought it'd be very appropriate for him to have on this episode series or this um, speaking series. So with that, I'll let you have it, Dr. Paul Matier, and thanks for your time today. Hey, thank, thank you, Jeff, and, and great to be here. And, and as as Jeff mentions, you know, I, I am a, an ornamental guy, but I do uh, play in the landscape and and I'm I've tried to make this presentation uh you know applicable to to also to the the turf grass managers out there and folk folks that that are working on golf courses and and one of the things you know when it comes to to pesticide use uh first of all you know pesticides are often perceived negatively and, and considered all around bad but when used appropriately um you know of course according to the label they're most often are very effective at controlling the targeted organism with minimal adverse effects to the environment, uh, including humans and animals. Um, you know, let, we, we have to face it that sometimes a, a biological uh, or a more green um, solution, cultural control option alone it isn't going to provide adequate control and the only effective option is, is to use a conventional pesticide. Um, one of the other things I, I always like to point out in our world and in, in when it applies to turf and ornamentals is that it's all about quality uh you know uh on the crop side the you know in, in agriculture you're you're growing whether it's tomatoes or soybean uh, it's about yield and uh but we have essentially a zero tolerance when it comes to to uh pest and disease issues so so in our world, it's, it's it's really reliant on on the solutions that are best uh, the best serve us, including pesticides. And I, I want to talk about factors influencing pesticide performance uh, first. Uh, pest pressure Mo can most definitely affect pesticide performance. It's always easiest and and often most cost effective when you're taking a preventative approach or when you're targeting low pest populations. Uh, that, that's really important. Don't let the pest or pathogen population get out of control because it's just gonna be uh, a waste of time, uh, effort and money. Um, pesticide resistance, unfortunately, does happen. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Uh, but some of the fundamental factors that influence pesticide for performance um, include depletion and deposition factors. So your depletion factors, you know, how long will a pesticide remain on the plant or in the soil? And what is expected of the duration of, of, the, of, that, of that particular, you know, of that product? And then deposition factors involve the application or delivery of pesticide to the plant or soil. So these are all really important when it comes to performance. And another thing I want to mention is uh, that this is really, we're in a dynamic environment. Things constantly changing, whether you're on a golf course or you're an outdoor nursery, we're exposed to environmental conditions. Of course, weather can impact pesticide applications. You put an outside an application and, uh, you know, it rains if, if it's, you know, before the rain fastness period on the label, uh, you could have issues with with product performance. And the other thing that happens, of course, is is plant stress. And sometimes, due to environmental stress, uh, the best thing is not a pesticide. And 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 so you can have a poor experience uh, with a pesticide application if you've got stress plants, and it may not be a, a primary pest or or disease issue that's affecting that crop. So. When it comes to to pesticide failures, um, I think you know most people want to go right to resistance, but but I actually um, I want to ignore resistance for right now and just talk about some of the more common things that happen. And first and foremost, an incorrect diagnosis. Uh, you know, using a a pesticide that targets, let's just say it's very selective and it targets the oomycete C group like uh, Pythium or Phytophthora, and you're using that product 
um, for an anthracnose disease, you're going to have a poor experience. So it's really important to uh, you know get a diagnosis, um, have a lab that you use uh, that's credible, and then make an informed decision when it comes to a pesticide application. Um, the other thing, of course, is the, the wrong dosage of pesticide uh, was used. So the rate and the application interval are very important when it comes to using a pesticide properly. A lot of research goes into those label instructions. So, so make sure you're following the label and using it according uh, to the label. Um, the, the other thing is take into account the type of active ingredient and the mode of action. So for example, if you're going after mites that are on the underside of a leaf and you're doing a foliar application with a contact uh, miticide uh, and it's contact only, you may have a bad experience or not you get poor control because you're not underside of the leaf. So you may need to switch to something that has greater translaminar activity or, or even systemic. Um, another factor is, is application timing. Um, you know, some of these, these products are, are very effective at targeting different uh, life stages of, of pests or pathogens. Or I'll just pick on weeds, for example. You put out a, a pre-emergence herbicide um, after weeds uh, have, have started have growing, um, you're, you're not going to have a, a good experience uh, with that with that product. And then, of course, another thing that some people don't often think about is just uh, how pesticides are being stored, and also uh, if they're expired. So some of these formulations uh, aren't just going to last forever. And they're also susceptible to extreme changes in, in in temperature, especially. So you don't want things you don't want things to freeze, and you really don't want storage facilities to get above 100 degrees. So you could have uh, issues with uh, formulation, and of course, that's going to impact uh, pesticide performance. And then, um, so you, you know, a good rule of thumb is you know to to use you you, you know the your oldest stuff first. So first in, first out is essentially you know how you want to handle uh, pesticides. And then water quality, of course, is is super important because water is the main carrier. And I, and I'll address that uh, here as we go. Um, and of course, I mentioned just the amount of time and effort that goes into uh, putting together uh, or bringing a new pesticide or a new solution. Uh, to the industry um, is is quite extensive, and and so there's a lot of research that goes into uh, these product labels, and so it's really important to to read and follow the label. Don't trust your memory. I, it, it it amazes me how many times I look at a pesticide label and I discover new things. Uh, of course, the the label that's on the package is going to be the most important because that's the the actual uh, material that you're using. But just also keep in mind that use of any pesticide in any way that does not comply with the label directions uh, and precautions, it's, it's illegal. So uh, the other thing, of course, to keep in mind when it comes to influencing pesticide performance is, is the amount of product that's the application rate and the time between application intervals. Uh, th this is really the bread and butter of the label um, and how best to use that that product. But then also other factors such as you know, the, the, the water volume, the type of spray nozzles uh, that you're using, whether your nozzles have been clean, uh, clean appropriately, they're not clogged. Uh, but water is the primary carrier for pesticide applications, and there's there's factors um, about the quality of the water. So whether it's hardness, turbidity, or or just the pH that can really um, throw off the the overall efficacy and performance of a product. And in our world, in turf and ornamentals, um, man, surface coverage is so important because again, you know, we we basically have zero tolerance. It's all about aesthetics. Um, and uh, we we have to uh, get a hundred percent kill, uh, or we're not we're not going to just we're, we're going to have issues. Um, and and one thing to keep in mind is that 
Research has shown uh, that 100% surface coverage is just really is not uh, possible. That's where like some of the translaminar type products or creative uh, uh, applications um, come into play to, to be able to get that coverage. Uh, but surface coverage is is mostly determined by application volume and again the type of nozzles you're using. And in the application volume, of course, that can be altered with changes in the spray nozzle uh, configuration. So application volume is defined as the amount of water used to apply a pesticide to the plant. And oftentimes in, in the ornamental world, uh, when we do drench applications, we use a much higher volume as opposed to, to foliar spray applications. That's just kind of a general uh, rule of thumb. But it, it is a function of the nozzle configuration, the delivery pressure, ground speed, and usually expressed in terms of gallons per acre and gallons per thousand square feet. Really, you know, survey of, of pesticide labels shows that there's no single standard application volume among products. So a general rule is, is one to two gallons per thousand square feet, uh, typically doesn't diminish efficacy. And uh, often you'll see on labels, it'll say sufficient water to ensure thorough coverage. Of course, spray nozzles, um, all types of spray nozzles with different designs and orifice sizes influence application volume and determine the spray droplet size, pattern, and, and overall coverage. So the International Organization of Standardization has kind of you know, standardized uh, the color code uh, for spray nozzles. So regardless of the manufacturer and the type of nozzle, flow rates are the same for nozzle tips of the same color, which that makes it really easy to, to follow. So for most standard nozzles, droplet size is influenced by spray angle and pressure. So I mentioned the water quality is, is, a, is a big one. And so water hardness is a measure of the total concentration of hard water cations. So these are the positively charged ions that you know, include calcium, magnesium, sodium, iron, aluminum. Uh, hard water cations can react with certain pesticides. I've seen this uh, often with insecticidal soaps, so like potassium salts and fatty acids. Uh, you, you can get uh, hard, water hardness can definitely reduce the, the efficacy of these soaps. The binding of hard water cations with the pesticide basically creates molecules that cannot, whether they're, they're going to try to enter the insect or the mite pest, or you know they often will go in at a slower rate, or they'll precipitate out a solution because of that the water hardness. And then same side, or it's, it's a very similar concept is is water turbidity, and this is a measure of the total suspended solid solid particles. So this can be soil or organic matter, also positively charged that are attracted to and bind with those negatively charged pesticide molecules. And this can inhibit the ability of pesticide to be absorbed by plant leaves. And of course, the inhibition of plant leaf absorption is important for, for many, many pesticides. So you're basically, you're just, you're crumbing up the, the, the system with, uh, with turgid water, or, or, or I should say a high turbidity of water. And then water pH, of course, um, is associated with the acidity or alkalinity of a solution. Um, I think everyone's pretty familiar with, uh, with the pH scale, but a pH less than seven is acidic, and in one that's greater than seven is alkaline. You know, stability is a fill, it, it's affected, um, or it's, it's also affiliated with the half life of a pesticide, which is the number of days required for 50% of the original amount of pesticide active ingredient to break down in water. So, a reduction in stability can substantially reduce pesticide longevity and effectiveness. So, when a pH of a spray solution is greater than seven, certain pesticides uh, are susceptible to alkaline hydrolysis. So alkaline hydrolysis is a degradation process in which pesticide molecules are broken apart or they're fragmented when the pH is greater than seven. Uh, generally, pesticide effectiveness diminishes over time when the water pH is, is greater than seven. Um, and this is this is fairly common in, in the organophosphate insecticides, so like acephate, the carbamates like methiocarb or, or some of the, the pyrethroids um, are highly susceptible to, to alkaline hydrolysis. So it's really important to look at the pesticide label and to read what is the, the, the optimum pH. 
and uh, make sure you're adjusting appropriately. So um, last, and, but you know, certainly not least, you know, resistance to pesticides uh, it can be a very serious problem. Um, and if resistance to a particular pesticide or family of pesticides evolves, the products can no longer be effectively used and, and thereby reducing the options available for pest management. So it, it's often thought that pests change or mutate to become resistant. However, it's not an individual pest, okay? So it's not like just one insect weed or microorganism that changes, but it's actually a, a, the whole population that eventually becomes a resistant. And that's when you have an issue. So when a pesticide is applied to, to a, uh, whether it's the turf grass or, or an ornamental crop, there's gonna be some tiny portion proportion of that population that uh, is not affected and may survive exposure to the pesticide. And then what happens if you continue to use the pesticide, those individuals eventually continue to breed. And uh, before you know it, they inherit the genetic traits that confer resistance to the pesticide. And then you no longer have um, a, a, an effective uh, product. So that's really uh, what it comes down to with, with resistance. And the nice thing is, in today's day and world, um, the majority of our products and labels uh, are easy to follow with the spray by numbers system. So you have the fungicide uh, resistance action committee group codes, you have the insecticide group codes, and you have the herbicide group codes. So if you pay attention to those those codes uh, and you rotate, uh, we shouldn't have any issues uh, with, with pesticide uh, resistance. And so finally, just some, some important considerations. Uh, you know, use the available resources uh, to choose the best solution. Make sure you uh, stay in touch with your extension state specialist. You've got a diagnostic lab. Um, on call to, to help you make informed decisions. And of course, you can rely on, on industry consultants. And then don't forget, you, you have to follow the label, the packaging label that's on that product, because uh, that is the law. And if at first you don't succeed, try again, this does not apply to pesticide applications. <laughs> So, so with that, I want to say uh, thank you for tuning in uh, for this episode of 15-Minute Fridays, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, see you again in another month.